In Houston, I'm John Herter. Tuesday, 30th of August. Great as always to have you along, everybody. In a nutshell, From the Experts is a virtual networking accelerator, helping people across industries connect very quickly in a brief, moderated, interactive show format. It's like a TED Talk with interaction. So what's in it for you? The FT promise, if all goes well, your curiosity has sparked new ideas, accelerate action, and you may have helped yourself or somebody else solve that problem, make a connection, reach opportunity faster. We know that making authentic connections and expanding your networks has never been more important to your business. Thanks to our underwriter for helping transform from the expert vision into action, Endeavor Institute, Unique Ventures, Ecosystems 2030, the Canon community, and Intrapoint. Each expert's in their fields. Connect with them and learn more at fte.network. You'll be glad that you did. Folks, help me welcome our guest expert, Chris Link Duarte. So Link has been committed to making the world a safer place through his efforts as a pro-human advocate, consultant, innovator, program developer, trainer, and storyteller for over 20 years. He is a veteran of the armed forces with bachelor's and master's sociology, criminology, law, and more recently, business analytics from Harvard. As co-founder and CEO of Linking Dreams, Link builds partnerships, helping organizations and businesses to design human capital strategies and programs, enhance their ability to reach underserved populations, increasing trust, commitment, customer revenues, and profit for the company. Link also advises various boards, initiatives, advocacy efforts, and chairs the advocacy work stream at the Center for Transformation of Work. Whew. Link, man, it's grateful that you're here with us today and looking forward to see where our group takes uh, the discussion. Over to you. That was a very nice introduction. Thank you, John. I, I, will you write that for me? <laughs> so I could take it into the future. No, that's great. Um, thank you all. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And I promise this is a presentation mode. So I only have two slides for you. I'm pretty excited to kind of uh, give a plug to uh, what I do and who I am and why this stuff is so important to me. And, and so I'm, I'm, I imagine that you all came today because you're interested in not only what I have to say, but you're passionate about the same th similar things as I am, this advocacy piece and what we do with this information. And so this is a good summary, a little bit of me sharing a little bit about my personal story as well as what I do, but what we can do from here and, and hopefully a discussion and, and give me some ideas and, and let's share and talk um, and discuss. We'll have a good time in the next hour. I'm really excited. Um, so my company, I'm the CEO and founder of Linking Dreams Consulting. Um, I go by Link um, from local to global. Our company inspires, inspires the world to be more inclusive of everybody. And what that really means is that if you look back at, I've just been involved in so many different initiatives. And I've been very fortunate to work with so many different types of companies and organizations, nonprofits, communities, um, not just local around me in Arizona anymore. I mean, that's where I started, but now across the globe. And it's so interesting how things vary across the globe. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but 20 years as an advocate and for underserved populations, and primarily my specialization is in LGBT. Um, with a background in policy, law, and social change, I've developed a number of programs that relate to connecting people to resources, LGBT mental health program, um, and more recently, an entrepreneurship program that I'm building. I'm a resource connector. People know me as the, the person that connects to resources. If I don't know, I know somebody who does know. Um, so I, I love that work. Um, it's, it's very, I thrive on it. I thrive on being able to help connect people to what they're, they're looking for. And then the last piece is really the systems consulting. So I work with a number of organizations and really how do we implement advocacy strategies at every level of the organization, in every di different department. And, and take it out of this silo that we're, we're aware that happens. So today we continue to help com companies, communities navigate advocacy topics from race to LGBT to fair wages to anything and everything you can imagine when it comes to underrepresented populations and how we include them. And I'm really passionate about the future of work arena. We're seeing so much change. And so I'm, I find myself gravitating to a lot of these types of projects where you know, now I chair the advocacy uh, council at the Center for Transformation of Work, where we look at all kinds of global issues 
related to how we're connecting people to work online and into the future and transforming the way we work. Um, LGBT entrepreneurship is a big part of my passion and, and helping other LGBT entrepreneurs as a self-identified transgender man. I have an incredible story that has impacted why I do the work that I do. And now that kind of filters through some of the work that I do today with programs. Yeah. And then resources platforms. I love the one-stop shop work um, and creating business connections. And then we work with all kinds of C-suite and consultants to help navigate the advocacy implementation. What does that look like? When you well, let's talk more about that. So, yeah, talk enough about me. If you want to learn more, check out my website. That's that's all I got. And I'm going to stop sharing. And I really want to have this this conversation really about, you know, when I started in the advocacy kind of world, right, I, I, it was about the passion and I was, I myself identified with the community, but you know, that back then 20 years ago, we changed ourselves to the principal's desk, whatever it took to get that change for inclusion. And then companies and organizations started to make these changes slowly, but surely we saw policy changes and inclusion happening across the, the, the globe, um, but heavily in the United States. And, and the organizations I worked with, it was it was kind of like finding myself on the fence. I was working with the the, the co communities that was the spirit of the volunteer, the passion of the advocacy and the change, but helping companies and organizations navigate that and what that looks like when there are fears around topics of difference. And so, you know, starting small and then starting to add on different issues, I. I started to find others that were working in the same field and doing some of the similar things and, and developing this network and becoming this, basically this connector. Um, but what I found is there's a lot of trends and I really want to focus heavily on those trends from about 2008 all the way up to 2020. Hey, I kind of carry, yeah. Um, can I interrupt you? Can you please yeah. tell us what you mean by advocacy? Give us the- Oh, Absolutely. The I see advocacy not just about, you know, we when we think advocacy, sometimes we think race or we think identity. But advocacy really means about those people that are underrepresented or squeezed out by data or that there is harm being done, um, where it's advocacy and change not only for those people so that they can gain access, but also advocacy helping the organizations include and what that looks like. So it's, it's a twofold. It's not just, you can't just do for one side and not do for the other. Um, and as a connector, that's what I mean when I talk about advocacy. Does that make sense? Did I answer that? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, what I saw was as I started building these programs and doing these different things, that there was a, there was a lot of the work was expected to be very low cost or almost free because you have a passion for these the people to change, right? And so the companies would not necessarily want to dump money, but when they did, they dumped it into data. Well, let's show that there's a problem. So now they had all this data through the mid kind of team, 2000 teams of all this data, but what do we do with it? And so there was a lot of action and, and things being taken, but what we found was that it wasn't being done together at the advocacy ground floor organizations and people started competing against one another saying, I want to have the one way of doing things, the right way of doing things and arguing amongst themselves and finding that those discussion spaces and those strategy spaces became echo chambers, you know, and if we fast forward into, you know, the, the current, I mean, we saw a little bit of it a couple of years ago with this tension, you know, and, and, and I'll get to more of that here in a minute, but, you know, I found is that, as digital technology started to take, people were going online, people were sharing their, their, their ways of doing things online. You could find resources online and not having to do it inside the building anymore. Now there was capabilities of what does inclusion look beyond just doing some policy changing, but to actually building dynamic programs. And you see companies start to build EIGs and DNI programs. You start to see this kind of trend and shift of companies saying, I want to take the extra steps to do something about it. Okay, and to so do, yeah. so when we use the acronym, find the acronym for us real quick. The LGBTQ. No, the DEI, EIG. DEI is kind of a general term now where it's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. When I say, um, you know, ESG and things like that, it's larger blanket models 
that's what I would call them, of saying that there's one way of doing things. And so it's easier to track data and things of that nature when you have, you know, a program. And I, I'll talk a little bit about that too. But what about eventually, the, say it again. The EIG. The EIG. Oh my gosh, I've known that as an EIG for so long. I forgot what the actual acronym stands for. <laughs> but if you look up EIG programs, it's Equity, Inclusion, and Governance. I think is what it is. EIG. Um, so we start to see this trend where companies say, yeah, okay, we're going to invest money into advocacy, but advocacy ended up being siloed in like HR and not at every level of the company. It wasn't adopted by the leadership. It was like, go do that over there because advocacy is like seen as the squeaky wheel. It disrupts, it disrupts progress and it makes noise and Companies say, I don't, I don't want a part of that right now. But what can I do to make it go away as quietly as possible and as cheaply as possible? And I found myself getting very frustrated saying, here you are taking initiative to do something about DEI and including in your company, but you're only doing something because you're recognizing that it's making your company money. And that those kind of things started to bother me as an advocate to say, okay, it's great that companies and organizations are including, but you're collecting data and what we started to see is that urban areas and cities and bigger organizations would start to own that data and to and funnel all the money into big organizations and not share it with the organizations that were actually providing the services so trying to set the one all be all kind of standards of what advocacy and inclusion looked like and making a profit so we saw it on both i saw it on both sides i saw it on the advocacy organization side of wanting to go for the, the, the money and to the one all be all and disagreeing with one another and companies wanting it done cheaply and not wanting to put it at every level of the organization. So on the surface, we see a lot of media and marketing, especially going into like COVID, right? And the pandemic where you see rainbows on everything during Pride Month. Well, or people, the LGBT community specifically started to say, hey, what about the rest of the year? And what, what's going on there? So as I started to take a look at some of these kind of global things and trends that I was seeing, I found myself also as an entrepreneur, right? And, and trying to make it work and trying to get hired and, and finding that I was running into roadblocks. Now as a white man, now that LGBT identity was hidden and how do I, how do I talk about DEI and diversity and equity? as a person that's not supposed to be talking about those things. And so I found myself in this kind of funny place, making friends with all types of different, different other advocates that were doing similar things to go, how can we start to break down the monster that we created and, and trying to create more equal measures that we've actually swung the pendulum in other ways. So during the pandemic, we saw things like trainers coming out and doing, you know, be less white training and, and, we saw harms being done and, and people advocates turning against one another. And so companies began getting confused and saying, who do we hire? Who can we trust? Who's got that measurement tool? We've now done and spent all this money to implement DEI strategies and EIG programs, but we don't know anything about it. We don't know if we've actually had the intended amp impact that we've tried to have. And so at the same time that this is all starting to happen, I'm getting these questions. I'm also obtaining a master's degree, right? In digital, digital transformation. And I'm finding myself in this future of work and going, future of workspace and going, wow, the same things and issues that I, that I worked with, with serving underrepresented populations in social services, for example, are the same issues that are happening everywhere with all types of populations as it relates to connecting to the future of work. And how they're making an income. So, yeah, you have a question. A couple of questions along here. Do you actually test the implications drawn from data with focus group input prior to clients investing in resources? It, it looks different for every organization. Some organizations collect the data first, then create. Some organizations are more passionate about the change, so create and then look at the data. So, it really depends. And it depends on location and size and all of the, like everything comes into play. 
But what I find is that what should happen with focus groups and analyzing and including the voices, that doesn't happen. Now that we have all this digital transformation, we're seeing it done with machines. But machines don't have a conscience. It doesn't have emotion and feeling. So it doesn't say you, you might have a company that has a thousand and one measures and they have DEI programs and they have support resources on their website. They might have all kinds of things, but do the people that work there or the people, the consumers that utilize their services, do they feel included? Do they feel like they belong? You can do all of these things, but if the people aren't consuming it nor they don't feel like they they belong, then, what data do you really have to show? And so the number crunching, as I'm getting this, this education on how are big companies doing it, serving mass numbers of people, and getting these questions of, can we build, you build an assessment program for a 72,000 employees thing? It, there's no off the shelf way to do that because there's so much conflict about what the right way to do it. That And one size fits all doesn't fit across the board for everyone. What do you do about this, this kind of set of challenges? So, you know, and I don't know when you want me to kind of unveil, John, some of the, some of the things that companies can do, but I think there's, there's so much I can talk about this topic forever of yeah. what I've seen coming out of, you know, yeah. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the kind of entrepreneurship side and, and the, now what's happening. So <laughs> we saw in these- we got two or three more minutes. Two or three more minutes. So what we see is that this great resignation, and this is how it ties to the future of work and my passion about this, is that those same things that people are looking for, the sense of community, the sense of belonging, they're going online to find those things. And there's all different types of ways that they're accessing a sense of belonging and community. And organizations are really struggling to kind of serve those needs and figuring out how to do that uh, appropriately. And at the same time, people are finding out that they love the flexible work. They like being an entrepreneur, but they don't know how to navigate that space. So now advocacy has shifted not only to difference, but looking at economics. How does, you know, your existence and whether you can afford a house or not play into the culture that you experience? Can you shift gears and leave the office and work solely from home? And what does that look like with accessibility issues of internet and internet speeds and money for health insurance benefits. And so now all of these things play into the role of advocacy and there's so much to unpack there of what do you first do? You have, you have all these different industries that are trying to address the great resignation and to serve this population and workforce. And we're seeing, you know, workforce grow. For example, India is the world's largest leading workforce right now, but the United States leads the industries of digital tech. So now we're looking at all kinds of issues, not only with race and culture, but economics and ge geography. And so the world is getting bigger. And as we have all this digital technology that can help us, it also creates more problems and more challenges and more holes. And so that's the part I'd, I'd love to have the conversation about. Right. So Link, as you're finishing your prepared uh, talk here, could you kind of share uh, maybe a few takeaways uh, that as you've engaged uh, the companies, management teams, and the communities? What are a few of the takeaways before we move to the, the open discussion? Sure. A few of the takeaways, what I see is kind of some solutions, you know, like as we kind of move through this chain, everybody's trying to hold on for dear life, right? <laughs> trying to navigate it. But Companies need to be more transparent about what they're doing and why they're doing it and include the people's voices at the table, not just as pillow talk, but as actually really authentic inclusion. Um, they need to take the time to include, maybe they don't need to be all to everyone, but they can have a resources page, for example, in their website that has some links to some helpful organizations that provide those services and support. Um, so that goes for a number of different things. Um, take time to create those safe spaces. It's not about treating people special or giving them special treatment. But as I was talking with a friend yesterday, we talked about this feeling of, of, of a safe space where our authentic voices can be shared and that be a part of our work life. And so there is this overlap of identity and work, but it doesn't have to be the sole focus of our work. 
but those safe spaces need to be created so that we have a place to speak and talk about what is needed. And so I think those are my three major, maybe one fourth. More tracking measures. Measure the impact. Is what you're investing in the, into the change really having the impact? And there's all kinds of ways to do that. And there is no one size fits all. So it's about developing relationships and partnerships to solve those, those issues and looking at all types of data before really, you know, sometimes people will invite me in an organization and expect a new program overnight. And in a month, I've written it out and they're ready to go for grants. No, there's a whole process of studying the culture and how it works and how an implementation of a new program will actually look and whether it'll be sustainable. So I think that's the biggest takeaway is looking at sustainability and impact as something that you want to last long term and being mindful of those unintended consequences. Thanks, Lane. Well, let's go ahead and open the discussion. Uh, Gus, will you drop the question in uh, the box for us? Uh, so this is really interesting, right? Um, you know, quantitative, qualitative, people are different. How do you find that right blend to help uh, companies uh, through this advocacy of their peoples uh, for productivity and for fairness? So the question is, uh, why do C-suite leaders struggle with recognizing and implementing advocacy programs in their companies? And what kind of lessons learned do you guys have out there? Maybe experiences that could help others accelerate through this process. So I'm opening up the floor, you know, We've got a nice sentiment group here, and I welcome uh, folks that would like to, to share their comments on that or, or other questions they may have. So, Karen, Isabel, could I ask you to step up and share what's on your mind? Oh, I, was I the first one on the, thanks to your uh, Zoom uh, quadrant? Or? Yeah, you're right there. Um, so hello everyone, nice to be, nice to be together. Um, so I think the main reason is that it takes time. And I think if you want to include different voices, you not only have to be willing to hear them, but you also have to train your people to listen for them and to communicate. And so if you want to build a real culture of diversity, which enables the advocates to do their work and enables companies to move forward and accommodate us, you have to train us how to do that. And I think we live in a reactive environment where everything is speed, speed, speed. Disagreement takes time. So if I feel that I'm in a meeting where somebody is systematically sort of bringing different points of views in or having a slightly different perspective or calling me on my blinders, half of my brain might be happy, but the other half is I like, can we please move on? You know, this is my 12th Zoom of the day. I really want to go, go on and go home and go do, do something else. So we, I think we live in an environment that is particularly unconducive to true empathy and true support. Um, you know, we're all quite anxious, quite wound up, a little bit depressed. And that also makes it very difficult to meet people where they are. I really don't like that expression, but I think it's kind of, kind of appropriate. Um, so the companies that I've seen that do that well are companies like Bridgewater, where, you know, people are rewarded for disagreeing. And the way that you reward somebody for disagreeing in a meeting is that you assign them the role of disagreeing and you find a way to separate the argument from the person, um, but it all has to be conscious. And that's additional work on, uh, on executives at a time when they're trying to you know, deal with inflation and deal with everything else that's going on. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, anybody else want to step in? Yeah, I'm checking out the chat too. Thank you everybody for all the links. I'm clicking on a few of those so they're open later. Um, yeah, definitely. And Heather's point to coming out during Pride Month. And yeah, there's a there's a whole organization, if you're not familiar, Pride 365, their global consulting entity that looks at the pink washing aspect, companies using the rainbow to make profit, but not putting it back in and investing in the company and the community. There's a lot of that happening in a lot of different. Go to Walmart, everything has a month. They're making money, but are they putting that money back in? Um you test okay, so the test implementations. What is my take on microaggression training? Um, I think that there's the place for it in some communities, but not all. I don't I think that microaggressions are a real thing. 
and I've experienced them. And I definitely experienced it. For those that might not be familiar with a microaggression is, it's, you know, the very passive things that happen, the things that feel icky, maybe not comments, maybe not actions, but it's ways that people make you feel when they're prejudicial against who you are as a person. It's not for any one reason. It's just they don't like that I'm transgender. So they treat me differently and exclude me from the party. And that's kind of a microaggression sort of sort of way. And macro would be like a company taking action to exclude someone. So as far as that type of training, I think that it has a place in some communities where that's a problem. And those people need to learn about microaggression. But I think that coming in off the top, at the very beginning, when maybe somebody is just getting a diversity training for the first time and saying, hey, by the way, what it feels like to them is you are being prejudicial without even doing anything, just your sheer existence. That's how they receive it. So when I do a lot of rural community work, I don't come out with the microaggression stuff first. They have to first buy in, take a bite of the sandwich of advocacy and see if they can actually identify with it and be a part of it. And if it feels good, then they can take on these extra set of vocabulary about what do the labels mean? What does microaggression mean? And how can I change my own behavior? But at the gate, they're not ready to change their behavior just from showing up. So it takes time. We get that. But the question, why do C-suite leaders struggle with recognizing and implementing? Do they always really? I, I don't know. I mean, it, let me ask some of the folks that are in the uh, uh, the uh, HR side of things or our sure. business strategy. Uh, I'd love Liz to talk about some of this because I, can you go ahead, Liz? I would love for you to talk about Riddle and what that looks like if you feel comfortable. Sure. Um, I think one of the reasons why some of those folks in the C-suites do struggle um, is because they're not down in the trenches. Um, and they simply are, they simply take that reactive approach versus the proactive approach. Um, I think in the world of education and compliance, which is my life that I live in, um, we, we take both aspects. We prefer the proactive approach. So we try to get out there before there are any situations or any concerns that are that, that arise. Um, however, we, we can't do it all. Um, and that's where those C-suite folks really need to come into play. Um, and they really need to be supportive. Um, and the question lies, how do we do that? Um, right. and, that and that's a challenge. And I think that's a challenge not only from the educational world, but also the corporate world. Um, and I think that that's going to come within a generational switch. Um, I think as the new generations come up, I think we're going to see that that change. But until that occurs, we just need to kind of see how we can can manage it. Right. So quick question uh, for those that are working closely with their CEOs, maybe Gail, you have some lessons learned or experience around this that you could share or Arthur, uh, I don't know if one of you could just share what's going on in your world with your management team. Um, yeah, I can jump in. Um, I think, you know, oftentimes, uh, and, and this is something that I, I work for a small company. Um, so I'm, I'm director of business strategy at Intech Workforce. So we have, um, roughly 250 temporary workers around the country on assignments with us. Uh, we have an onshore team of about 20. Uh, we have an offshore team, you know, with our own office space in India of about 30, uh, roughly. So we have a geographically distributed team. We have people from different backgrounds, circumstances. We have uh, temporary workers ranging from, um, you know, low, lower wage or frontline occupations to folks making well over a hundred dollars an hour. Um, you know, so we, we really do have a diverse group of folks and in the conversation of DEI and advocacy, I think what's often lost is that, um, and please don't misinterpret this, but I think oftentimes executives, leaders want to 
you know, s- skip to the good part, right? You know, they, they oftentimes look at diversity. Oh, you know, I can achieve diversity by doing this one quick thing. Um, but equity and inclusion are very hard work. Um, it, it's, it goes a lot deeper. I think you, you have to know your audience, right? Uh, you know, the workers we deal with, um, are very different than workers, you know, line workers in a, a plant, right? I mean, the the, t- the type of workers you're dealing with are going to have their own individual challenges. Um, and it's, it's up to executives to lead from the top down as to how to make, how, how to, how to evaluate the conditions of the workers, figure out ways to improve access, uh, improve fairness and promotions, um, improve collaboration, uh, you know, get them a seat at the table, so to speak. Um, and it's just, frankly, it's just hard work. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot harder than um, reading a research article on best practices in DEI and saying, I'm going to implement that because what works for the fortune 500 is not going to work for a small business. And what works for somebody in um you know, renewables is not going to work for somebody in the software industry. So you, you have to know your audience. You have to put in the hard work. Um, and I think oftentimes that gets lost. Got it. Any other feedback, people working with uh, C-suite leaders, experiences, things that worked, didn't work, ideas? Well, Ned, you, you had something in the chat I want to kind of highlight, highlight about there being this idea of a minimal tool. Because what we say, okay, we don't like one size fits all. But I think that, you know, there you're on, on to that point is that there is a certain level of metrics that organizations should meet, right? Um, making sure there's inclusive policy, I think, is a good starting point, <laughs> you know, just from the top. But there's all kinds of things that I think, um, you know, that some organizations, depending on who they are, might have a list of 10 things that they, re- that they require. And they're very similar across the board. Um, but I think a majority of companies are kind of past that piece they know what at least basic things that they should do it's now they're asking the deeper questions about okay what is it that we've now learned from everything we've done and that's the number one question and why aren't we it feels like sometimes the efforts weren't enough like here we are in this place and we're still seeing racism we're still seeing issues within the companies right but man varying degrees why are we still seeing this if we've done so much work and I think there's something to be said about the visibility factor, about what this work creates visibility. And now what was once ignored, yes, dealt with by those people, but ignored, now is being brought to light and people have something to say about it. So yeah, we're just sure. seeing it a lot. Right? Maybe why don't you share it I'm sorry, oh, say that again. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry, just um, adding in my personal experience. I used to work in um, corporate insurance, so very, very large multi-billion dollar companies. And um, what I noticed in my observations were C-suite level was actually very open to all recommendations, all backgrounds. It was the senior VP level, so a level just beneath. They didn't want their status quo upset. It was very much old boys network. They had their, you know, everyone went up the path. If you were a relative or a child of someone executive, you just worked your way right up. They were the impermeable barrier and you could not get past that. And often if you were seen as a threat, you, they worked very much against you. And that, I mean, unfortunately, it's not the most positive thing to talk about, but I think the more we discuss it and the more we have it out there, the more people can address it because we are not addressing it. Right. You make a good solid point about the larger companies when the force of anti <laughs> is so great. What do you do to kind of break into it? And I, <laughs> I heard this quote and I couldn't even say it perfectly, but it goes to the idea that build a wall around them, build a crowd for those that feel as those that are strong and powerful. You got to get the voices of the people. So if, for example, there were petition being put out or media being put out about this and people were willing to talk about it and put them unfortunately that's that they would put themselves at risk but if there's loud enough that that good old boys network is going to be really afraid about being sued and so if enough people are making enough stink and they're joined together by force 
it creates erratic, disruptive <laughs> change in the organization, and then things can move from there. But those are the drastic cases sometimes that are necessary that get loud, but that's what it takes to really at least make a break in the shell. That's the mint feeling. Right, we've got some good <laughs> folks. Uh, you know, Wendy was saying people are getting braver now, just like you were talking about, Link. And, and Karen comes back and says, you know, company CEOs are in a lot of pressure to act. And uh, so they think, you know, voting rights. Uh, I didn't quite understand that, Karen. Could you expand on that just a bit? So one way to think about it is that the big companies are not moving because they're so big. The other way to think about that is that big companies actually move very fast because they're very visible. So, for example, you know, Walmart worked really was much faster than anyone in setting up funds, you know, for to promote equality, promote supply and diversity. Uh, you've had a lot of CEOs coming out for the Georgia voting rights. You've had, uh, you know, the head of IBM, Merck, American Express, uh, Ken Chino, Ken Frazier, and Ginny Rometty uh, creating 110 that is, you know, committed to creating a, a million jobs. Uh, for Black Americans, you know, within the next decades at a living wage. So in some ways, the big companies might be slower, but, I, I'm, you know, we, we'd have to do our research. But in some ways, because they're so visible, they're also being quite reactive. The problem with the CEOs is that at what point do you stop talking? And I had this even in my team where people are like, well, aren't you going to say something about Ukraine? And I said, no, you know, I don't, I don't know. There are topics about which I don't know. So you also have then CEOs who are forced to say something because they feel like it. So... I think it, it's an interesting, what I think is the model in the middle, like the medium companies that do not have a lot of visibility, but employ a lot of people and do a lot of damage. Uh, those may be the ones that, um, you know, we might want to think about most about how to, how to change for Wendy's point. Interesting. Thanks for that. We, uh, Gail, please, uh, Gail's with a, a pretty large software firm, I believe on the West coast. And we'd love to hear what you have to say. So Gail Morales right? Yeah, that's you. Yeah. Actually, I'm not with a software company. Um, oh. I'm actually uh, uh, a retired, shall we say, banker, but I'm sitting on a couple of boards right now. And this is interesting to me because as a board member, you're a coach, but you're not a player coach. And so I wanted to get uh, more of a perspective on what you're seeing uh, from a digital perspective, because every single organization that I'm a part of, or, and frankly, in previous work, is all about digital transformation. And I found what Chris had to say about um, the impact of not having that personal understanding, even though that's what they think they're doing through the, through the technology, and the implications of that. And so when you talk about that in, in the context of change management, when, what Wendy said about who the big barriers are when you're driving change, because I'm a transformation executive, that's essentially what I've done most of my career. It's always those guys that are one or two levels, two levels down, that are the barriers uh, in terms of getting work done. And so as a board member, my worry is, we are advising the C-suite, the CEO and his team, but the real folks that need to hear the messaging, we're never gonna get to them. And so my then question is how to do that, um, how to get to the folks that really need to be influenced. And they're diff it's difficult to influence them because this is about their personal beliefs. This is not about changing a division from one thing to another. This is how they behave. Just some thoughts. If anyone has any suggestions around that, it would be wickedly helpful to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can I make, can I, make a I have things, but I don't want to jump in. I want to. I want to hear if anybody else. But that's a. Mm, that's a good one. Thank I'd, you for that. I'd like to chime in, uh, John Matthew Douglas here, um, I Press Forward LLC Consulting. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with. Uh, an organization that led to <clears throat> culture. I've had the opportunity by way of following my own passion to take a very deep dive into social determinants of health. And, and just based on the data and also my, my professional opinion, um, DEI is very much a downstream scenario. So we have to go further upstream. Moreover, 
getting to the point of intervention, and and I think this may address the question that was posed recently. Um, DEI, you know, I, I liken it to, you know, you, you cannot enforce uh, love and empathy, but you can enforce accountability. And so when DEI uh, goals and objectives are linked to performance metrics, that creates a different conversation because it's no longer a matter of here's how I was raised, here's my social filter, but here's how DEI can move the needle on expanding markets, can move the needle, needle on improving our, our culture. So I think there's a lot to be said in, in that sense of the word. And then the final point, um, there is what is called the social determinants of entrepreneurship. And to really begin to go down that road, one would have to embrace the reality of today, which is entrepreneurship is no longer a nice to have, it's a need to have no matter where you are in your continuum of your career. And one's ability to think like an entrepreneur, not only is it going to bode well for him or her or other, but it's going to bode well for the company. So those are some, those are some points that I wanted to share. But again, at the end of the day, <clears throat> to accountability and, allow, and aligning um, performance metrics to goals and objectives of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, we've got time for maybe one more comment, and then we need to uh, have last word from you, Link. I just want to thank John too, for your amazing comment. Thank you. Yeah. John, you have a hand up. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Temperature? I, yeah, thanks. Um, I just, I, I kind of wanted to piggyback on what Gail was talking about and some of the stuff that I, I you know, I've heard Link share today. Um, for those of y'all that don't know, I'm a former uh, Army medic. I deployed at 19 as a nurse, and then I was also uh, a former federal firefighter for seven years. That's actually how I met Link while I was a firefighter in Arizona. Um, and now I'm currently building a consulting agency um, that specializes in, in DEI work. I've also built the first B local chapter for the state of Texas. And um, we're primarily focused on how do we, how do we, you know, meet these needs, right? And address these needs in such a way to where the focus isn't on that bottom line, that revenue model, right? It's it's focused on, you know, in order for us to make money, we have to solve problems. In order for people to show up and solve these problems, their personal problems have to be solved. You can't show up to work if you're dealing with you know, uh, lack of safety or physiological needs or like self-esteem needs, right? And so building models that are just a part of the work environment, primarily focused on giving these people the opportunity and freedom to be able to solve these work problems, right? Because that's actually a need. There's a cognitive need there. We need to be mentally challenged and stimulated, right? But you can't meet that need if you're already at a deficit of emotional needs and belonging needs. And so, you know, with, with the work that we do, we, we try to identify like what makes this person unique, right? Everybody on the team is identified as a star player in the team. We identify ourselves as a constellation. And so when we go out and do the work that we do, we're representing a constellation of stars, Right. And each one of those stars have their own solar system, their own world, moons, planets. They got stuff going on. How do we keep those stars operating and maintaining their solar systems and shining the way that they do? Because it's important because if they're not shining as bright as they should, it impacts the constellation, impacts all of us. Right. Agreed. Uh, thank you very much, Nebuchadnezzar. I think we need uh, smart bright stars like you and, and everybody else on the call who have got to go at it from their own direction. I think everybody's got to pull it in and it's going to take that time. Uh, Lou, did you have something you wanted to? Just, you know, we're talking about diversity in terms of, of, of race, uh, ethnicity, uh, uh, gender identification, and so on. Uh, but in my experience in the healthcare industry, 
uh, a lot of the problems are, though, I mean, that does exist there too, but a lot of the major problems in terms of moving forward on many initiatives in an organization is diversity of professionals within the organization. You have your physicians, you have your nurses, you have your technicians, you have a, a whole bunch of department managers within the within a hospital setting, for example, and every group has their particular agenda. And when the organization is trying to bring uh, a new innovation on board or getting people to participate in designing a new innovation, you find pockets of resistance. Uh, the doctors, they don't want to do that. Or the nurses say, I'm never going to do that. And so on. And how do you bring everybody on board, appreciating the differences in their expertise to come together so you can move forward in an area that, that really needs change. I would love to take that one on because I, man, seven years working in the behavioral health, healthcare arena and working with that very challenge. Uh, it was great to create a training and say, okay, everybody show up. But usually, you know, 10% of your company shows up and they're the people that already agree with you. They already get on board with, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they're your, they're your cheerleaders. They're not the ones that need to be there. And so I, and I found that if you swing the pendulum the other way and make it mandated that they attend trainings, now they come in with grief and, and don't take in what they're really intended to, to learn. So I found that it was a, it was a slow shift. And some of the ways to do that is it takes that Unfortunately, what Karim was saying about the reactionary, it takes somebody, something happening, somebody saying something wrong and somebody filing a complaint, but then those complaints get kind of siloed. So in healthcare, what I, what I always encourage organizations to do is find the people specifically tailored to the department. So if it's an LGBT, there's resistance from the doctors, for example, then find a doctor that does LGBT specialization to talk about not just the identities and the letters and what they mean, that's simple stuff, but the, what does this look like in healthcare practice? Why do you need to know that I'm transgender? Because it could, it could mean that I have an x-ray that measures female bones and I'm listed as male and it could cause me health and havoc. It could, it could kill me if I'm prescribed the wrong drug. So that's it. Now it's tailored to something that's actually important to that department that, oh my gosh, if I don't actually listen to part of this and learn it now i might cr be creating harm and actually injuring somebody and so that's that's the step i would then take to say it's not about changing people's beliefs it's about making them have it take a commitment to doing no harm and those medical folks they take an oath to do no harm and so if they're lack of desire to attend a training or to learn more is going to negatively affect the clients and patients they work with now they're a liability so you start by explaining to them they're a liability by not taking this more seriously and that they'll be on company time and get paid to show up and that they're making a commitment to do no harm and all you're doing is providing the tools to them to help them do that then they're much more apt to show up. Thanks, Link. So last comment from anyone before we go ahead and close this out. I'd like to comment if I may, and I'm going to do that. Someone had mentioned earlier about a disagreement kind of, kind of award their company had. So I'm going to push back ever so slightly on you, Chris. Um, I, I think that, you know, it, telling a or expressing to a healthcare professional, and I say this only because I'm not a healthcare professional, but I studied business administration, healthcare, and have worked in the field for over 20 years or so. So I, I can speak based on that. So I think that it's there's a danger in speaking to a clinician in that way. There's a danger in that number one, there is a uh, this kind of exodus within, within healthcare. Many physicians, nurses, they're either leaving the industry or they're jumping around here and there. So we don't want to become that disruptive, I believe. So I, I think that this conversation has to be taken to an area that is being embraced and that's health economic. 
Um, there's a lot to be said about a study that was written pretty a, a number of years ago, back in 2009, 2006. It was a collaborative between John Hopkins University and University of Maryland School of Public Health, where they explored the economic um, burden of healthcare inequity. So I share this with you because those who are less likely to embrace the, the real value of diversity, equity, inclusion, whether it be clinician or non-clinician, when we can tie to that the argument of an economic burden that can be avoided. And in this particular case, it was shown that the economic burden reflected north of $200 billion over a four-year period. And within that same period, when extrapolated out over the United States economy, it represented an opportunity to uh, essentially reduce overall spending or spending in healthcare by $1.24 trillion. Again, spending that exists because of the economic burden of healthcare and equity. So I think that's the kind of conversation that needs to take place. Uh, yes, I, I fully agree. Gail, any, uh, Gail, did you have anything you wanted to add before we leave? No. Okay. Well, Link, I think that's going to be the last word. We ran over time because it was an excellent conversation, and obviously we need to have it. So, folks, how was the discussion and talk today? Please take the 30-second FTE survey that's being dropped in the chat right now and let us know. It's important to us. You or somebody you know, a thought leader, wants to test drive their current challenge, get new ideas, and help others connect and learn? Our call for experts is always open, growing fast because of you. So keep sharing FTE, inviting other leaders that you want to connect with and network with. Check out our on-demand library of experts and content that's available on video and podcast. Today's post-show notes will be in everybody's inbox here and a little bit later. Uh, and next up on the FTE show, Next week, as a matter of fact, Chief Innovation Officer Ed Hidalgo shares his challenge building talent pipeline that's adapted for today's rapidly changing workforce. Week later, Tuesday, the 13th of September, CEO Mike Bloxton leads the conversation around discovering purpose when you ask the right questions. And three weeks from today, FTE and the Endeavor Institute launch the Energy Transition Channel. It's a big deal with guest expert Nick Welsh. So find these and more on our website at fte.network. Folks, we're out of time. Thanks once again, Link. Great show. And to all of you for making time to connect and learn on From the Experts. Hope to see you guys next week.